The days are getting shorter, the water is cooling down, but the smallmouth action on the river? Red hot! This second DVD in the River Smallmouth series by Blue Ridge Kayak Fishing details top fall patterns and tactics, including suspending jerk baits, spinner baits, rattle traps, flukes, topwater plugs, crank baits, grubs, and tubes. Three chapters on difficult conditions will help you master fishing in muddy water, post cold front, and on really windy days. So sit tight, take notes. Class is in session, starting now. Today we're going to try to get a uh, top water bite going. Uh, the air temperature should be about 65 degrees today, a little sunny. Those are conditions that, that I don't like when it, there's a lot of sun. I'd like to see some more cloud cover. But this time of year in the fall, sometimes the fish will break the rules. They're going to be biting on top water maybe all day sometimes because they get really aggressive and, and they're feeding. Uh, water temps are probably hovering right on the edge of, of 60 degrees. And so, again, the fish should be pretty pretty active in those water temperatures. Uh, I'm just hoping that we can, we can pick some up and find out what they like. Uh, we'll try some different presentations. Maybe first I'll try, you know, a fast presentation to see if the fish are, you know, wanting that kind of presentation. And then, you know, if that doesn't work, usually what I'll do is back off a little bit and try, you know, a couple pops if I'm using a popper on top and just letting it sit uh, as long as I can stand it. Okay, I've got here a, a light, nice collection of uh, top water baits that I usually uh, go to. Um, the top water bait I use is really based on the mood of the fish and the presentation that I want to put out there that I think is going to work or I know is going to work through trial and error um, during the day. This is a walking bait. It's one of my favorite baits. It's uh, made by Al Winko. It's a hand carved, hand painted bait. I can walk it on top. It's also got a little um, concave nose here so that I can also pop it a little bit and spit a little bit of water. This is a great bait for really um, delicate presentations where you don't want a lot of motion on the bait. Yeah, you can walk it, but then you can pop, you know, walk it a couple times and it spits and then just let it sit. It spits, let it sit. This is another great bait because it's a, it can do, you can do a lot of things with this bait. Uh, it's a tiny torpedo. It's a prop bait, so it's got a propeller on the back. I don't really pay too much attention to color, uh, but what I like about this bait is that you can pop it in place. So you can, a couple snaps of the wrist, and you can pop the bait and then just let it sit. Sometimes you pop it a couple times, let it sit, and then you buzz the bait. So you can actually turn this bait into a buzz bait. So that's one of the reasons I really like this bait. Um, this is a, you know, a storm bait, a top water. Again, it's a walking bait with a little bit of popping lip. So if the bass's mood changes that day, I can, instead of walking it, I can pop it. And this is an oldie, but a goodie. This is probably uh, one of the forerunners of a wake bait. This was made in the mid 80s. It's called a meadow mouse made by Hayden. And basically this is a wake bait. I call it a top water bait because I'll hold the, hold the uh, rod high and I'll retrieve the bait and it makes a big wake on top. A nice steady retrieve in low light conditions and the bass hate this lure. I mean, you can see the teeth marks. These aren't from rocks. That's from fish smashing this mouse. As far as top water baits go, the best conditions are really clear water. When you have clear water conditions, the fish can see the bait better. Um, they just seem to be more keyed on things that are on the top. The other condition that's not really related to water conditions is fish feeding behavior. If you see feeding behavior where the fish are smashing bait fish on top, uh, taking bugs off the top of the water, that's another time, even if the water conditions aren't quite ideal, that you might want to throw a top water bait on and start chucking it at the fish. This is a really nice shoreline. It's clear water and it's protected from the wind. Good place for top water. Hey, Juan, what do you do when they they smack at the lure and you, you actually don't connect 
if, if a fish smacks at the lure and uh, they don't connect, a lot of times what I'll do, if that happens like two or three times on a retrieve, I'll just kill that bait where it is. Uh, and then I'll actually reach down in the cockpit of my kayak and pull out my follow-up bait. My follow-up bait is actually a three-inch stick bait. It's a real delicate presentation. It doesn't make a you know big splash on the water. And I'll just lob it out there and let it hit the water. And then usually the fish that's missed that bait will hit this bait. Missed him. He's still there. Yeah, he's there. He's there. Got him. Got him. He's hooked up. He's hooked up. Jump. Don't jump. Don't jump. Ah. Got him. It's a nice small mouth. I, I threw that top water bait in there. Um, he hit, he swatted at it a couple times for whatever reason. He just, you know, couldn't quite, uh, didn't quite want the bait. And uh, I killed the bait, threw that three inch stick in there, just lobbed it out there, a little bit of a poop on the water, and boom, right there he is. Perfect. Let's let this puppy go to fight another day. Nice fish, probably about 17, 18 inches. There he goes. Uh, one of the things that I do a little bit different than a lot of other folks do with top water baits is that I'll, I'll use braid. My rod is a light action rod with a fast tip on it. I want it light action so I get a lot of bend in the rod. One of the things that I, that I noticed when I was kayak fishing a lot of times is when you're fishing that top water bait and you pull back, rear back on that fish, you get line stretch if you're using mono and you get a little bit of a lurch in your kayak. And I found a lot of times that I didn't quite, I didn't feel like I was getting a really solid bite into that fish when I reared back on it. So what I did through some experimentation is changed up the braid and then also I use a leader. The leader. Both fall and spring feature wild swings in temperature. The dreaded cold front followed by bright blue skies seems to shut down fish activity in a hurry. One day they're blasting top water baits, the next you struggle to coax them to nip at a slowly dragged jig. Anglers who can adjust to the moods of fish best described as bipolar, as quickly as they turn on or off, will enjoy a consistent bite all the way into winter. This is the progression of lures that I, I used today. Uh, I was out here yesterday and they were, they were definitely aggressive and they were on a very loud, flashy, fast moving and, and fairly large profiled buzz bait like this. And um, that's what I started with today. And I had, I had one fish blow up on it, but he didn't, he didn't take it and I fished it a lot. I stayed with it probably too long. Um, but making the transition was important. Deciding that, hey, this isn't what's working. So what I did is, you know, you'll go from something that moves fast to something that you can move fast and is still a large profile, um, but you can also dead stick it and you, it can be a finesse bait part-time. This can be a, a reaction bait type bait by skittering it and then it goes into a, a dead stick. But I still wasn't getting bit on this. So I went to, we were seeing a lot of crayfish, so I went with this lure right here. Um, fairly, fairly large size profile. Um, caught one on it, um, but still wasn't getting the number of bites that I thought I should have been. Went to a smaller, smaller profile yet. Um, didn't get any bites on that. And then I went with the smallest profile uh, that I have in, in terms of a crayfish um, profile here. And this is what caught the, the one I just got. So the progression and decision-making process to go from, from something that you can cover a lot of water, that's a big profile, and you want to use as big a profile as, as will get bit. Um, and yesterday was the case. I mean, multiple 18s and 17s on, on this buzz bait. Today's a different day. And dialing down in terms of how fast you're moving a bait and... Um, you know how aggressively you're fishing it and also how big it is 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 something that probably took you took me a little bit too long today but I did make the the decision to to scale back incrementally and it took going 
very small to and, and very still dead sticking something like this uh, a really a finesse presentation to to catch that first you know nice size fish you get that smaller bait we've been fishing larger baits but really had to downsize today. Standard, well, standard size baits usually work, but when you have a really tough bite where you're not catching many, you're not getting many bites. This was a smaller creature sized creature bait. Ah, oh, he's fat. Oh yeah. Let me paddle over and see, show you what downsizing does. Very small, profiled bait. The last couple of weeks, uh, the fish have been on the river, the fish have been really tight to cover. Uh, they've been tight to the ledge rock. If there's a pole, pile of boulders creating current break, the fish have just really been tight to that. And so the presentations we've been making have had to be really precise. So if I'm throwing, you know, a, uh, a, a tube, I've got to lay it right up against that ledge, keep a nice tight line, keep contact with that structure, keep contact with that ledge, and that's where I'm, that's the, the strike zone. The strike zone is really about a foot from the ledges or for, from the uh, rock that's causing a current break where the fish are holding. Uh, it's been like that uh, for the last two, maybe three weeks. Uh, also, the presentations have to be slow too. Uh, the fish are just kind of, I don't know, they're just kind of lethargic and you just got to let it sit there and let it sit there and then finally they just, I guess, decide they're going to take an easy meal and pick it up and you got the fish. Nice fat! <laughs> he does not want to come up. One of those fish that's taller is he's taller than he is long. Nice. Another another fish with that very small profile. How many hours did we go this morning without a fish? Five. Five hours, no fish. And we were fishing big and fast and progressively smaller. And then here in pretty rapid succession, we have two, two of them over 17 anyways. Let's see how long he is. I like to wet the surface I'm gonna put a fish on. Nice, nah, 16 and a half, but he's pretty, Nice, nice stout chunky. fish. Thank you. <laughs> Sometime in early fall, subaquatic vegetation starts to break loose. This cover that concealed bait fish all summer is suddenly gone the smallmouth capitalized on abundant minnow forage with no place to hide. Today we have extremely low water and uh, it's clear for making long casts and all I'm using is a five inch case salty shad. I'm throwing it out there. I'm trying not to move it too much because there's so much grass in the water right now. I'm just catching grass. So it's a great presentation. We are late September and we're, we're basically targeting any kind of deep water, any structure where the fish are active. All right, as you're fishing that, you're doing good because you are truly dead sticking it. Okay. What I want you to do is, because you, you cast it out into some current, okay. is give it a little bit of slack next time. In other words, give it enough so that when you, you know, when it touches down, it's not pulling, 
you know, it's it's not immediately on taut line. Right, okay. Now you're watching that line as far out as you can see it, down by that grass bed. Okay. Or, or no, there's a rock or something down right, there. Yeah, right, yeah. But when that's, that starts taking off, when that yellow line starts moving, then you know. I've gone, honestly, several hours without a fish. And earlier in the week, I was looking at how much rain fell up here. I was really expecting a much bigger rise. He's in there good. And it just didn't pan out. Like, we're up here and there's just still it's, it's early fall, but we still have summer low conditions and not real conducive to uh, the crankbait bite I thought was going to pan out. Um, even the buzzbait hasn't been chased much. We're still dealing with low clear conditions. Uh, but I finally got this one on a... I'll go ahead and let him go. He's a nice chunky, maybe 15 and a half. Finally got him mostly from watching my buddy Chris catch a couple with a similar bait, but this is really downsized and gone back to the the finesse for low clear conditions. Um, and this is a an Al Winko or, or Winko Custom Lures River Darter Jr. Very small profile bait. The reason, um, well, one of the reasons I went to this is we it is fall, it is early fall. We have a lot of grass coming down the rivers and it's it's frustrating. Like the crankbait was really just dredging up a lot. Um, and really anything with weight. I was even doing some nose hook soft plastics that had some weight on it. And they were just picking up the snot grass and, and the eel grass and everything that's that's coming loose. Just like the leaves on the trees, um, they fall in, in the fall. The grass in the water also loosens up and, and breaks free. So. There's a weightless lure, and that's going to be much less frustrating to fish with all this grass coming loose than any other bait. A weightless and finesse bait. So, so you're watching those foam bubbles. Mm -hmm. If you get a bite, you want to you want to have an idea of how fast that foam was moving, where you got the bite, because that'll become a big part of pattern development. Right is the speed of the current. If the foam was just sitting there in, in a real narrow lane out in the middle where you got bit, or if it was uh, or if it was moving there pretty quick. I was reading in your book something about the, the laminar line? The laminar flow. The flow, yeah. Yep, laminar flow is where it it moves evenly across a, a flat bottom surface. And sometimes it's very shallow and when a big fish is just chilling out, when he's not doing much, go ahead and straighten that on the hook. See how that's, uh... Yeah. The laminar flow is, is, uh, is just somewhere they, they hang out. It's, it's not somewhere they're going to be if they're actively feeding. It's going to be somewhere oh, yeah, that's right, right, that's when they're right. just kind of chilling. Alright, flip your bail and count out how long your dead sticking at. Are you watching your line way down there? Yep. Are you able to see that real well? Yep. When that, those coils start to take off, that's when you got one. Did he get off? Yeah, man, I was a fish fish too. They chased it. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> you get one fish in the pool excited and they all kind of wake up. Okay. So expect a hit. It'll happen that way a lot. You'll, you know, you, you'll, get, you'll get one fish, even if you don't bring him to the boat. You'll get one and he'll be amped up and all the other fish in that pool will be amped up saying, hey, Mike just ate. I'm gonna eat. Right. What'd you get him on? 
Waco River Daughter. Let me see the bait. And how'd you have it rigged? Nose hooked it. Just nose hooked it. What's the hook? It's just a must add uh, mosquito hook, is all it is. Cool. Add the box. All right, let's let her go. Rattle traps are often thought of as a largemouth lure, something you rip out of the emerging vegetation in the springtime. But let me tell you, better yet, I'd like to show you this overlooked lure aggravates river smallmouth into biting. It's a great search bait, especially muddy water. Switch to a rattle trap. Again, something gold and fast. Ah, he jumped once real good. I'm hoping he stays buttoned. I got one hook in him. Big gold rattle trap just burned real fast, straining a lot of water, golden fast. Although we're gonna go back to that spot. See where this 18 and a quarter incher was was holding. There he goes. See ya. Ha <laughs> ha! Yes! That's what he hit. A gold rattle trap, something a little bit more noisy, but Still, it's the, the same overall presentation of, you know, big, gold, and fast. Um, he was up in a spot, I, I stuck the paddle down, and it was hard bottom, about that deep, same as the first one this morning. Uh, it wasn't at the top of the eddy, it was out in the middle of some, uh, you know, a series of ledges that are running this way that come up to the surface and come back down. He was, you know, he was tucked in behind one of the, the ledges there. Up at the tops of these eddies, where I got a real tight area to, to put something, and I'm going to have a lot of collision with branches and such, I will use the spinnerbait. But as, as the eddy widens out, up here it's pretty narrow. There's a, a definite point to it, but back here it's almost half a cast wide I'll switch to a rattle rattle trap you know I wouldn't use this up at the top where I got to have a lot of collision with logs and rocks and stuff because it would snag up a lot but if I'm looking to carry the wide part of the eddy the real meaty part of it the rattle trap does a really great job I always take a couple different passes at it Sometimes from the outside casting in, sometimes from the inside casting out. You never know when a different angle is going to produce a hit that you wouldn't have got otherwise. Hey, got one. Another one on the rattle trap. Ah, get away from the legs. Another 18 or so. I don't like not being near my net. Okay, he's coming over here. That's really what I consider that Rapala rattle and wrap is a middle of the, the water column crankbait. So let's get him back in there. Being on the water as the rise is occurring is a scenario playing in my head each night as I dream of big fish after big fish being caught. My dreams have a very realistic quality because I've experienced it many times. Rising water is the best condition possible. The increase in stream flow stirs up food and big fish know it. This is no time for finesse presentations. Go big, go fast, and go loud. You're going to work hard to maintain boat position, but a multiple big fish day possibly a personal best, will likely be your reward. We're lucky that we have a, uh, a gauge predictor for this section of river. The United States Geological Survey 
that might have been one, can predict what the rise is going to be. And we do have a rise today. They had a real gradual uh, rise, about a four tenths of a foot is what we're supposed to get today. Anytime it's rising, I like to start with a fast moving bait to get these aggressive fish up at the tops of the eddies like this. Rising water is <clears throat> really my favorite for throwing lures that you that you cast out and wind back in. Um, you know, the river's coming up, the the flow is is increasing, it's dislodging a lot of the um, the things like the, the decaying leaves on the bottom. Today we have a lot of grass that's, you know, that's loosening up and, and taking off. Um, but it's also dislodging a whole lot of, um, of things for them to eat. So things are, you know, things like crayfish and, and sculpins and mad toms and darters, everything is kind of jockeying for position. They're moving around in the, uh, in the water column. And water column is something I wanted to, to talk about because it seems like on certain days they're, they're more predisposed to eating something off the bottom or, or they're predisposed to looking at the surface for something to eat or something in the middle of the water column. What I have here is a bunch of different cast and retrieve type lures uh, that cover the bottom of the water column the middle of the water column, and then of course your, your top water that everyone loves to throw because you get to you get to see it happen. Um, I, I can't really say that I'll I'll start with one over the other, but I'll I'll definitely work through all three. Uh, the buzz bait, obviously for for early fall like it is now, it's it's right at the end of September, uh, is a really great option. Um, Top water plug like this, this Sammy. As we move into the middle of the water column, um, the jerk baits obviously work work great in the cool to cold water period. Um, here I have a fairly large jerk bait, one that's a little bit smaller, and if it's if it's a tougher bite, I'll even go with a grub. Here's a translucent grub. And that's a real subtle presentation, something that you know you can keep moving just like the the jerk bait but it's it's uh if if they're not hitting it as aggressively the grub is a great way to cover the middle of the water column also the rattle traps and i'll use the smaller ones in uh in clearer water you know if, if water like today i'll probably use the silver one uh because we still have even though we have rising water we have fairly uh clean water it's not it's not brown by any means as it does get brown, I know we got rain coming tomorrow, a significant amount of rain, and I'm back out here in, in uh, two or three days. If I find brown water, I'll go with that, that gold rattle trap. Um, For working the bottom, obviously you have your, your tubes and, and, uh, and jigs and things that are let it sit approach, but again, rising water, we want to fish baits that are, that are moving. The bigger baits, the bigger bodied baits push a lot more water, which can be important in that um, in muddy water. Um, obviously the rattles help as well. But I'll play around with different sizes of, of crankbaits. These are all sort of crayfish um, <clears throat> imitating baits. They're they're pinging across the bottom, they're you know they're crashing into stuff, and that's really what crayfish, at least crayfish that are um, that have been dislodged you know, by the rising water, they're banging into all kinds of stuff. I have two of these, these mid-size crankbaits here and they're, they're two different colors. I have one with a black back and red sides. That one I'll throw in the muddier water. And then on the bottom here, I have one that's kind of an olive color with uh, predominantly cream, cream sides. Um, I'll be throwing that one today because we have fairly clear water. It's still rising, but it's it's also fairly clear. Look how fat he is. We had a rise yesterday. Everything eats on the rise. Uh, today, I think they're they're full, but they're still eating. But look at that belly. They've been a lot skinnier than that, and uh, this one's been eating quite a bit. So let's get him back in there and let him eat more. See ya. If I had only one tip of lure to fish the rest of my life, it would definitely be a tube. They can represent so many different types of forge and can be rigged so many ways. Here's how I fish them in the fall. 
The best place to start when patterning fish with tubes is to assess the stream flow trend, water clarity, and any recent temperature changes. This data, along with trip reports from prior years, will help you determine if the presentation should be swimming the tube, dragging it along the bottom, or dead sticking it. As a recent cold front hit, slow it down. River on the rise, speed it up. What's up, yeah. man? Nothing, just checking the river gauges. <laughs> what do you got? Well, I didn't quite get there yet. Probably like 4.17, still before. It's not yeah. dropping, but it's also not yeah, coming up it's, real it's, fast. Yeah, it's coming up really, really slow. Before we put our kayaks in today, guys, I wanted to look at the trip reports. Um, this is from about a year ago. This was from November 10th. Today is what, November 6th? And this really helps us jumpstart some patterns. The biggest one was a 19 incher uh, on a one ounce uh, black spinnerbait with a, a single uh, number six gold Colorado blade. Here's the, here's the important thing, um, location type, under a foam trail. And that's under in common with how I got most of uh, the other ones, which were on Cabin Creek tubes. Um, Motorola and Goldfleck Cabin Creek tubes. I like those this time of year because um, I think at certain times of year when it, when it cools off or when you have temperature fluctuations where it gets warmer and colder and warmer and colder, spring and fall, uh, it, it definitely shocks the, the minnow forage base. Uh, and <clears throat> basically, it stuns them. And I think a lot of, I think a lot of the sculpin and darters and bait fish that are on the bottom of the rivers get shocked, and they're just, I mean, it's 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 easy food for them. And the Cabin Creek tubes are such a, a you know, longer, skinnier profile. It's more of a bait fish profile tube than it is a crayfish profile tube. So we got a real nice foam lane sitting right up here and I cast it right to the top and I'm just drifting back down and I'm tracing that entire foam line. And I'm one hand paddling to try and keep my nose into the current so that I'm not drifting real fast. Uh, but I am drifting downstream just quick enough that, you know, that I have a real slow tumble with that tube. I'm always in contact with it. I'm not moving up on it, but at the same time, you know, I'm not moving back so fast that that tube is constantly, hold on, hold on. Oh yeah. Oh, he's good. Again, at the end of that foam lane. tube smoke with blue fleck very much a minnow profile still get another rigging tubes there's really sort of an endless list of possibilities of how you can rig a tube I'll go over a couple of them here probably the most basic way to rig a tube is with a jig head like that that's just a ball head jig or Here's one that's that's specially made for four tubes. And just shove that sucker up in there. Once it gets up to the top, poke that through. And you're ready to tie. Or you can add a glass rattle. You can shove that up in there. But before I do that, people play around with different lengths of how far they'll shove it up in there. That'll give a completely different darting action, not going up quite as far. I have a lot of different profiles here. Basically, I'm going for a couple different things uh, in terms of what I'm trying to represent with a tube. Uh, if it's a crayfish I'm going for, I'll get you know some of the, the more natural colors um, that don't have glitter. I mean, this is, this is a great all-around standard green pumpkin. What I'll do with those though, because a crayfish's tentacles and claws will spread out like that, I'll cut that and just rip that and that allows it to 
instead of having a linear profile, it'll triangulate out like that. Just gives a, I think, more of a crayfish profile. The other, you know, main type of forge that you're trying to imitate uh, with the tube is bait fish. Uh, this one right here is a Cabin Creek tube. It's a uh, smoke with blue fleck. I got some motor oil with gold fleck. These are, you know, these are all bait fish imitators. And really, my favorite way to rig that is with an internal weight. I have a uh, it's just a little eighth ounce egg sinker in there. And I'll play around with different weights. If, it, if there's a lot of current cranking, I'll, I'll bump it up to quarter. If it's really cranking and I'm, I'm catching them in the mid, mid river ledge eddies, um, you know, I'll bump it up even a little bit more, sometimes up to three eighths. I really need to punch through current to get down into those, you know, the vertical eddies where you have the two ledges coming up and there's a, they're, they're tucked down in the bottom. Uh, whereas, you know, if you have an eighth ounce tube it'll come down and get swept over it the heavier lures will you know will get down in there and, and really punch into that uh, all right so I got the egg sinker in there you put the glass rattle it up in there as well and then you just rig it you know straight in the nose coming out the chin this is just an extra wide gap hook this is a I think a four aught Just leave it like that and you, you can tuck that in just to make sure that, that that hook doesn't doesn't get start digging into the rocks and get dull you always want to check for for sharpness though because you're you know you're rooting around in the bottom and the you know first couple inches of line are going to take a lot of beating and your hook points going to take a lot of beating so you always want to inspect those two things when you're uh, when you're fishing tubes another hook and it, these are all ones that, that I have do it molds for but this uh, this one is weighted here in the bottom so if you don't like the internal weight you can take that out the 3 8 ounce dragon head the confidence baits is perfect for larger tubes and you can put a glass rattle in there too but it's just got a nice kill weight that's up that weight is always going to go down Each, each of these rigging styles is going to have a different motion of the bait in the water. Um, the ones that are that are <clears throat> rigged with the weight all the way at the head, you know, they're going to pivot on the head, which is a great crayfish, you know, crayfish profile, uh, crayfish, crayfish motion. They're going <laughs> to bless you. They're going to pivot on that, and those tentacles are going to come up. Probably my favorite rigging method, and this one's a little bit unique, and I'll, I'll get into it in a little bit, <clears throat> is the is rigging it backwards. This is a smaller profile. Uh, it's actually a hoghead baits hog slop tube, and how I rig that is I get the egg sinker in there, and then the rattle, and then I put a little bit of a soft plastic stick for, for a sake of, well, I'll just show you. I'll pull out the whole thing. Just that little nub is in there. And you're rigging it the same way that I rigged this guy here. Except I'll use a smaller hook. I'll use a 2 out or 3 out. And you're rigging it the same way you rig a Senko. A soft plastic stick. Except when you get down to the bottom, Just hooking it like that to keep it in in position and what that'll do when you have that on bottom you can raise your rod tip and lower it and it'll really pivot on that nicely it also keeps it um, keeps it from snagging this is my least snaggy setup is the, the backwards rig tube so give that a shot Mike, I think you got another another way to rig tubes as well. Yeah, just a basic Texas rig. Uh, 
with a bullet head slip sinker. Let me get it over here. Just a slide head on it, and then I Texas rig it. But what I do is, so not to go through both plastics, I take my knife and I cut the back of the tube. So actually that's just free flowing in there. And then just pinch that. And then this way I'm not going through two sets of plastic to hook the fish, especially like now when they're just taking the bait a little bit. And uh, I feel like I get a better hook set with that. And the, the tube will actually come up away from the rock and float up this way a little bit. That, that sounds good for your you know, your bait fish profile. Yeah. Your bait fish will come up off the bottom where right. it's the Great fish, you want down, you it. want them down like how you rigged everything else. Right. Just with a with a bait fish, it gives them just a little bit more action where it'll it'll hover just a little bit and uh, hopefully it you know makes the fish want to eat it. Right. But yeah, I mean as you can see, there are just endless possibilities of how you can rig a tube and and really endless um, you know types of forage that you can you know you can imitate with a tube. Go catch some tube fish. There you go. Nice man. What'd you get him on? Tube, uh, smoke purple flake. Nice. Nice healthy guy right there. Did he hit it hard or was it? He uh, kind of swallowed it, and I just felt it and set the hook. It wasn't. It wasn't. He didn't slam it. Fred, do you do you fish tubes much at all? No, I don't. Um, I don't have a lot of confidence with them because I've just never been very successful working tubes uh, in river situations. Wow, you're missing out, man. Let me show you a couple things. I mean, I'll show you what, I, what I've been doing this morning that I've caught a couple with. Right. But yeah, a river angler that doesn't know how to fish tubes, we gotta, we gotta correct that. All right. Let's give it a shot. We to bring that up and we'll, we'll get out of here. I really need to, to help you get stationary. You're wedged on a rock right here, right now, which is great. You can pop one up into that angle. That's about the extent of what you can fish from where you're at. We're gonna get out there in the ledge systems and we're gonna we're gonna find spots that you can wedge your kayak or you can one hand paddle and do what I call drift and drag. Okay. Failing the tube bite is such a huge hurdle for most anglers, especially as the water becomes cold. I felt the need to borrow some footage from the Winter Patterns DVD to provide a few tricks to help. Second thing you want to do in order to feel the bite better, after you get stationary, you have to get completely still. Get your boat still, get yourself still. Second thing you want to do is to establish and maintain line tension with your bait. Right now I got a paddle tail grub sitting out there and I can feel a very solid connection. I can feel it sitting right on bottom. Some days you're going to need more weight in order to do that. For instance, here are two tubes. This one's got a quarter ounce egg sinker up in there and this one has an eighth ounce. I was out in the river a couple minutes ago and the river was really cooking. Uh, there was a lot of wind blowing and I needed this quarter ouncer uh, to, to really maintain contact and really be able to feel the bait and feel that it is solid on bottom. It's not moving. Now that I've pulled up into this creek here, uh, the, the high banks in this creek are giving me a little bit more of a break from the wind and also the current isn't flowing as hard so when I go to a tube I, I'll definitely throw that eighth ounce you know only use as much weight as you need to in order to feel the bottom because you know when they they pick up something heavy they know this isn't quite right so you want to get you know use as little weight as possible uh, in order to establish that that real solid contact with the bottom because when that that when you stop feeling that contact with the bottom, you stop feeling that hard, you know, you stop feeling, yep, it's just sitting there, you'll know that, hey, that's a fish. That hard tension will just 
lift up and it's in a fish's mouth. If you're lucky, you get one of those, you know, signature dick feel, you know, feelings right in the, the end of your rod. Usually it doesn't happen that way. The other reason you want to have a real nice rod, that braided line if you can get away with it, and the shorter cast so you can feel, yeah, the reason you want sensitivity beyond just feeling the bite is that you will know when you get bit, what your lure was on. Right now, I feel it, it dragging over some gravel. Um, sometimes you can feel it, you know, banging its way through some... That's something. That's a snag. You, you can feel it banging its way through some chunk rock. Uh, you certainly know when it, it, gets, uh, it gets into a softer bottom. That's, that's part of pattern development, you know, knowing really uh, feeling what's out there without being out there. I mean, you you can run over them. I just came loose. You can run over the spot in, you know, you run over the heads of the fish. And in winter, I think they'll, they'll calm down if you didn't bang around a lot. But it's much better to, to assess what the bottom substrate was from a distance uh, by probing around with your tube and or your jig uh, and you really you can't do that with a heavy clunky rod Oh yeah, nice. Nice. What I got here is a, a grub, and I use it um, pretty often when I'm fishing for smallmouth. Okay, here's here's a selection of grubs I use. As you can see, I use about every brand under the sun because, really, to me, I want something that you know that has the right color, the right action that I'm looking for based on the water conditions. So these grubs are actually kind of in order here. Um, you know, when I'm looking at clear water conditions, I'm looking at like a smoke color, this two-tone, the laminated a smoke color grub is great in clear water. It mimics a lot of bait fish that, that are in the Juniata River and in the Susquehanna River. This one happens to be a Glida grub uh, by Venom. Uh, this one is, again, I, something I use in clear water. Uh, it's a uh, Mr. Twister, you know, the, the old standby. And this one has a smoke head on it and it has a kind of a yellow chartreuse uh, color tail on it. I like this one in clear water as well. Now as I'm moving down the line here, you can see this one is, is a Kalen's grub. And it's, it's really, uh, you know, like a chartreuse and, and fire, kind of a fire tiger color. Um, I like this one when the water's starting to get murky, when the visibility is starting to drop. Uh, you know, when you get, uh, you know, like two foot of visibility or so. Um, I'll use this grub a lot and then once the water uh, clarity gets really dark, uh, you know, stained, uh, then I might start to, to change up to some of the darker colors like this one is, is a green pumpkin uh, twister tail grub. This one actually is a swimming grub made by Al Winko. I like it because you can see already it's got a really elongated tail on it. Uh, this, this grub has a lot of tail and it's got a lot of great action and I like that. Uh, this, and again, I use this in, in more muddy water or I'll change to a, a black color. I to think get that's, more contrast. that's also the one you have on your spinnerbait, isn't it? Yeah, this is actually the, the kind of grub that I use on my spinnerbait. And again, as I said when I, when I talked about the spinnerbait, I'm looking for action, just some added action to that spinnerbait to get that fish something a little bit more to look at and a little bit more for it to decide, hey, I'm going to hit that thing. I typically let the fish tell me what, what they want though. When, a, when I'm fishing tubes or I'm fishing a bait, you know, a plastic bait, and I'm reeling it in, and, and I get bit when I'm reeling it in, or I can see a fish chasing that bait, uh, that's when I kind of say to myself, mm, it might be good to, to put on a grub and, and swim that grub. And that usually it's, it's right on the money. Uh, when I've got the fish that, you know, they're chasing a tube, or I, all of a sudden I'm reeling it in, I feel weight on the tube, and, and the fish is there, but then it's gone, I'll immediately go to my tackle box, uh, pull out a grub, 
and, and basically start swimming a grub. Uh, really great actually in fall uh, and also early spring too uh, when the water's cold. For whatever reason the fish just seem to like this bait uh, at those two times. When fishing brushy or chunk rock areas, rig grubs on a 1 8 ounce dragon head. This weedless and very snag resistant jig head features a thin wire hook that results in immediate and solid hook sets, whether you're swimming it or dragging it along the bottom. Okay, I talked about uh, swimming the grub a little bit. Another technique that I like when the fish are feeding down um, and they're feeding, you know, feeding down off the bottom for crayfish or whatever it might be is basically dragging it. I just call it dragging it. Basically what I'll do is I'll cast the bait out and uh, let it hit the bottom. So the bait's on the bottom now and then I'm just going to drag it about six inches. Let it sit six to eight inches and let it sit. Drag it. Let it sit. Drag it. I just got caught on the bottom there. Let it sit. Drag it and let it sit. It's just a nice technique when they're feeding down. So there are two different ways you can swim. You know, you can fish the grub in the middle of the water column by swimming it, on the bottom by dragging it. Okay. Not a bad fish for fall. Caught this fish on a uh, on a grub. Uh, basically, earlier we were getting some bites on it, but they were picking it up and dropping it. Or we were we were basically just trying to set the hook, and we just couldn't get a hook in them. So what I did is I downsized to about a two inch uh, swimming grub. And I put As the water becomes cold, the more subtle paddle tail grubs become much more effective. What'd he hit? He hit this, uh, when it goes cold water bait here. I rigged on a 1 8 ounce jig head, a football jig head. Uh, just letting it sit there. There's a nice foam slick, and I just threw it into the top of the foam slick, let it sit, and he was there. Um, not, didn't hit it hard. He was just happened to be there. Uh, sucked it in and just started moving out. Very nice. You got one, Fred? Yeah. What part of the eddy was he set up in? At the top, middle, or bottom? Up in the top. Uh, well, about three feet from the uh, current break. Nice. Right behind it. Very nice. How big? Uh, looks to be about 15, maybe. Sweet. Nice, man. As river flow fluctuates, smallmouth shift position within the eddies. Here are some ways to keep up with their movements. Caught this little fella. Was uh, right behind the uh, current break. We had some shelf rock. When the water is rising like this, I like to fish the tops of the eddies. That's when it's, they should be aggressively feeding. We had a little bit of a rise overnight it's still not quite stained i'm still trying to figure out whether it they're at the top the middle or the the tail end of the eddy but when they're really aggressive as you know the case usually is with rising water you'll frequently find them pressed with their their noses right up against the current seam at the top of the eddy now as that that river drops back down they'll move towards the mid part of the eddy and then as it stabilizes to low and clear again, they'll get to the downstream part of the, the eddy where, where it just kind of pinches off. The current, you know, comes together in like a V and they'll, they'll tuck right at the end of that. That's when it, you know, when you start getting some clarity back to the water. One thing you gotta worry about when you're fishing the tops of these eddies is the circular current that pushes you up towards the front. You don't want to crash it. And this is something that I really got to teach people because they don't always have an awareness that they're moving forward. Always keep one eye on, on something stationary so as to let you know, you know, hey, I'm, I'm being pushed up towards it. I do a lot of, you know, backwards paddling with my line in the water. Just to make sure that I'm not crowding that spot. 
Now they're not always up at the top of the eddy. I, I see most people fishing tops of the eddies in most conditions. There are times where you want to key in on the mid part and the tail end of the eddy. Um, pretty, pretty much when the water is dropping, you know, when you've had a rise and the river's starting to come back down, they'll start to stabilize in the center part of the eddy. They're not as aggressive as they are when the river is rising. And then after it's, you know, it's on the downstream slope of that bell curve of the, of the rise on the USGS gauge, you're going to target the tail end of the, the eddy. Now, normally, when you enter a spot like this, you'll drift down one side, come in the, the bottom of it, and cast up towards the top. Now, if you've keyed in on where they're positioning, top of the eddy, you know, tight to the, the eddy seam, middle of the eddy, or bottom of the eddy, you know, once you've figured it out, your, your job as far as how you're maintaining boat position gets a lot easier. And as it's dropping, or, you know, if you just figure out that, hey, they're at that, that spot at the downstream side, go ahead and point down there, Bill. Go ahead and point down to the, the tail end of it. Where that V comes, I mean, it pinches off. You have current on the left and right. Come back to me, Bill. And it'll, it'll come together in a V right at the, the tail end of that. That's a great, a great place where it's, it's coming down. You know, the river level is coming down and it's, it's stabilized. They'll position at the downstream part, which is actually right where most of your, your kayak fishermen will set up. They'll go right and sit on where they are. In those cases, I like to sit up at the top of it and I'll even use, kick my foot up on the, the ledge rock there and cast downstream and, and drop it right on top of them. All right, I'm pulled into the top of this eddy and cast it to the downstream part here. Let me get the net under this guy. And in maintaining boat position, that's a very, really nice place to uh, tuck up against that to fish. You know, this, this ledge trench as it tapers up towards the back. Very easy spot to hang out in. An early childhood mishap with a crankbait's treble hook and subsequent trip to the ER soured me to these effective smallmouth catching tools. But fishing with many crankbait experts over the years helped me warm up to them again. No serious smallmouth angler should be without a selection of them along with a moderate action rod to fish them. When I'm fishing crankbaits in areas where there's kind of a mixture of rocky and, and woody or grassy areas, um, I'll keep two rods up front because crankbaits can really bog down in things like the wood here, or the, the grass patches, and having a spinnerbait at the ready to target those areas, you're, you're not going to bypass them. Whereas if you were, you just had the crankbait rod up front, you know, you would probably subconsciously, I know I do it subconsciously, not cast it where a crankbait and all its trip, swing and treble hooks are gonna get caught up. So, you know, keep two rods up front and, you know, one that can, can come through the rocks nicely and one that can come through the, the wood very nicely. We're coming up on some deeper water down here, and with this medium diving crankbait, I've been maintaining pretty good bottom contact in, you know, two to five feet. Uh, we're gonna get into some deeper stuff down here, and if 
if I retrieve it the way I've been fishing it, it's, it's going to lose contact with the bottom. It's going to be swimming along in the middle of the water column. And if I'm trying to imitate crayfish with this, it's, uh, it's not going to work. You know, the crayfish isn't going to swim like this down through the middle of the water column. It just looks unnatural. I might catch some smaller fish doing that, but the big one's no better. So one thing that I'll do is I'll make as long a cast as I can. The, the longer the cast you make, the, the greater the depth you're going to attain with a crankbait. Um, the other thing I'll do is I'll take the rod tip and stick it down, and that'll give me an extra, extra couple feet of depth attainment. I'll, the rod I'm using is a St. Croix Legend Tournament deep cranker. Uh, I like this rod over over other moderate action rods like um, there's a lot of fiberglass rods out there which are great because you don't lose a lot of fish on them. They're softer, they, they give more which is important for these treble hooks but what this rod has over other moderate action rods or softer rods is that it's sensitive. It, it can still, you know, just like a jig rod, a, a, a fast action jig rod, you can, you can feel the bottom very well. Um, but I can feel the, the bottom very well with this and you're thinking, well, why is that important maybe? Is that, is that, you know, it's not like you need to know when to set the hook. It's really all about pattern development and knowing what sort of bottom substrate that I was on. Uh, was this crankbait digging along in, in some chunk rock? Was it pea gravel? Was it, uh, was it a sand flat? And, you know, with this rod, as I'm bringing it across, I know exactly, like right now I'm in kind of a mix of chunk rock and, and, uh, and pea gravel. And if I get hit right now, I know, hey, that fish was in a mixture of chunk rock and pea gravel. So the sensitivity is a... Uh, in a crankbait rod can be really important. I felt the last couple inches of this line, actually I can even see it. There's a, there's a nasty nick right there. With this crankbait digging around in the bottom, it's definitely going to take its toll on the, uh, on the line here. I use fluorocarbon line, which is, you know, for the leader. I got braid on here, but the fluorocarbon line does well with abrasion resistance, but you still have to pay attention to it, and you still have to retie frequently. I really don't want to leave this crankbait in a in a fish's jaw. All right, I moved pretty quickly down to this spot because I saw a bunch of ledge rocks along here, and all I'm going to do is move across it and fish that that taper up at the end of it. You know, I'll take a cast, reel it in, and by then I'll be kind of swinging, getting sucked down into the next pool, and I won't let that happen. I'll move up and. Uh, take another cast a little further on. One thing I'm not doing is just drifting willy-nilly downstream and casting left, right, wherever, because I have a real specific type of area in mind. You know, I have, a, I have, a, I have targets all over, and it's, you know, it's the water that's tapering up, and I got the lure that they want right here. That's really the beauty of pattern development, is, you know, with, you know, six miles, or six hours to cover eight miles, um, I'm going to hit all A water. I saw one spot of isolated nervous water out in the middle of this. Oh, he's big. And I cast just up from it, which brought it right past it. I just barely have that in him. Yeah, my theory on you know, fishing top water, middle, and bottom, at least this time of year, is that, you know, when you have a cold snap like we've had, they're gonna wanna hug tight to that bottom because that bottom is still, you know, nice and warm. And same thing on a reservoir. 
um, they're gonna hug tight to wood because that wood is a heat reservoir on the river here the uh, the bottom is holding some heat you know this you know the river water's cooled off quite a bit in the last day or so but that bottom especially anything organic is going to be still warm you know still holding some heat so let's see how long he was yeah, he's 19 and a quarter and he he absolutely crushed that crankbait let's get him back in there look how fat he is they're definitely feeding up i mean it's it's october 30th and they're getting getting a feed bag on so thank you very much off he goes all right this one hit a crankbait towards the end of the uh of this eddy i really thought with the rising water let's let him go see ya i thought with the rising water they would be up at the top and usually when it's when the river's coming up there at the top but you always have to to pattern them you know try top of the eddy bottom of the eddy middle of the eddy and what we have up here is you know it, you, you have a series of ledges running across as we go down and you know i threw the crankbait up at the top and i always had an awareness of of you know how far back in the eddy so that when i got the hit i knew you know hey that's where he was you know brought it down through the middle and it was right towards the the point where i could see the next next ledge coming up shallow and i can read these lines running across the nervous water is, is linear going across as it was coming up i just was reeling along felt rock rock just grinding 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 and then boom stopped and i said all right i'm either snagged or that's a nice fish and then i felt that head throb um, you know felt that that weight and that real slow steady head throb and then he took off he knew he was hooked so let's go up and see if we can't catch any any more of them at the taper up the part of the you know the the eddy as it's you know the tail out right as it comes up shallow again that's what i got him on a crayfish pattern crankbait and it's you know it matches the color of the crayfish in this river now we got we paddled back up here to check out exactly where that fish was and here i was targeting the top of this eddy right here where all that foam is gathered there's obviously a high point in this ledge that blocks enough current to cause this lane we got all that that foam in the lane going all the way back and we're we're in a big ledge trench running like that and where he hit i'm gonna turn you was right back here as the ledge trench was i mean it, it it's up high here and then it goes deep and we're in the deepest spot here yeah i can't touch bottom uh and then it comes up shallow and we're coming up on it i can see the nervous water going all the way across in both directions we should be able to hit bottom here in another 15 feet or so because i can see it i mean you can you can see it just looking down this lane see that nervous water and that's what i'm going to do is is moving downstream from here you know it's it's the back side of the eddy back side of the you know downstream side of this ledge trench yeah and now i'm hitting actually i hit sand which is is the downstream side again it came up and then came down and that sand settled right there so let's go see if we can find some more of the the tail end of these eddies and ledge trenches Right up at the head of that wood up there. Man, he's on there good. Very nice. 
less than a foot of visibility and see you buddy that that got his attention Gaudi is Las Vegas that big spinnerbait got him muddy water poses a number of challenges to anglers um, primarily in that you need to uh, to really present to not so much their their sight which is their dominant sense um, but other senses uh, certainly their lateral line their their hearing um, you know their their sense of taste and smell um, and choosing the right lures is important uh, the rattle trap is one that's a favorite uh, it's a very noisy lure that comes through the water and they their their lateral line swim bladder e inner ear all of those organs pick up this coming uh, coming down the, the river um, I will upsize a great deal in muddy water like this today so this isn't the same one that I would throw if it were you know um, four foot of visibility today we have about a foot of visibility so much larger size lure and that's the case for for most of what I'm throwing um, suspending jerk baits have a nice thump that really uh, speaks to their lateral line and also has the rattles crank baits um, for fishing the bottom of the water column um, I will go with darker colored lures uh, in in muddy water uh, but again that's that's pretty far down on on you know um, how important things are because it's it's sight you know color is is uh, appeals to their sight and uh, again the the rattles in it and the size I, I put a uh, skirt on here just to bulk it up to give it a bigger profile another um, lure that I like to use to bulk up the profile is the, the spinner bait and I'll use this is just a small swim bait body that I've put on there as a trailer um, and that thump and tail back there it just presents a much larger target uh, which is important because again like I've said you're appealing to their uh, their lateral line um, the Colorado blade is a is the right blade for stained water uh, because of because it does push more water um, and again I go with the darker the darker colors here are two smaller profile baits and I'll use these um, well, all the other lures are lures that I would cast and retrieve, and I'm straining a lot of water. But if I have a you know fairly good idea of where they are, uh, and I'm, I'm pinpointing certain spots, uh, these two lures do very well. Um, the black tube, and I have this one as a backward rig tube, um, and then this is a strap jig or any any hair jig. And again, they're they're darker colors, uh, but what's important in both of them is the rattle. Um, you know, you're really, really appearing, appealing to their other, other senses um, besides sight. I will appeal to their, their sense of smell and taste by applying scent. That way, if they, they pick it up, um, they're going to taste it and know they've got the real deal. One nice thing about fishing muddy water is that you don't have to worry about stealth quite as much. In clear water. There's no way I'd be as close as I am right now. But in this muddy water, I can get a lot close, which allows me, especially while working a bank like this, to get more casts. I can hit each little eddy as we, we drift down past here. Whereas if I was out further, the water from here on out um, is sort of dead water. You know, I'm not, I'm not catching fish out in the middle. The fish I'm catching are tucked up in there. So. In terms of areas that I like to fish, um, Today we're here in, at the, the tail end of a little scrub island here, uh, and there's a lot of vegetation. This, the grass that's in the river here does a number of things um, to clear up the water, actually. And I'm looking out in a chute here, and it's definitely very brown, uh, you know, stained water. But here, right in this, in this grassy area, um, it's, it's clear. Uh, the grass slows down the current. Um, provides a place for minnows to hang out. It um, it definitely filters out a lot of the sediment. So it's it's where the food is and it's where you know the most water clarity is. So definitely you know look for you know the tail ends of grassy areas like this. Um, when a river comes up, 
it's a great opportunity to catch a lot of fish, um, you know, on these cast and retrieve lures. Uh, once it's up and it's muddy, I do a lot, a lot more pinpointing of, of certain areas, um, like the tail end of this scrub island in this grassy area. Um, the roots will grow down into the, um, the gravel and hold it tight, and just on the downstream side of it, it'll say the current's going this way, and here's all your grass, and the roots are coming down here like this, and on the back side it scours out, and they'll tuck right up in there. Um, because that's where the food's going to wash out, um, and it's it's where there there's a block from current. Um, other areas include shoreline. Um, the, there's a bunch of log jumbles along here uh, that I'm, I'm sure have some fish holding on them. Uh, on a day like today, this was probably the first big rise uh, that we've had. Um, where it's actually um, October second. And this is the first really good rise that we've had in, in quite a while. So, and it's cooled off the water quite a bit. So, I'm looking for them to to move to the uh, the wood on the shoreline because the the wood holds a lot of that residual heat. Uh, whereas the water has cooled down quite a bit, they're going to tuck in next to that log, and the residual heat coming off that log is going to keep them a little bit warmer. So. But yeah, it's uh, a lot of people kind of throw up their arms when it's when we have muddy water like this. We just have to remember to appeal to their their senses other than sight, uh, namely their lateral line, uh, using big bigger lures, um, their size, their their sense of hearing, use things with rattles, uh, and then their sense of taste and and smell. Spinner baits can be the easiest lure in the tackle box to fish. They're perfect for coming through cover cleanly, rarely hang up, and certainly qualify for the title Big Fish Bait. But how an angler fishes it determines whether the presentation is a shot in the dark with unlimited ammunition or a well-planned kill shot with a night vision scope. Here are a few less than conventional approaches. Early fall, I prefer to burn my favorite spinner bait, the Assassinator Baits Clacker back to the boat as fast as I can. Targeting the fastest water pays huge dividends in September and early October. Right up in that current. Ah, oh, he's a pig. <laughs> Get in here. Yeah, he was right up in the fastest part of that current. Real aggressive spot. Um, I got a trailer on there. Real big profile, real nice big profile. And I was burning it. I was really moving it fast. So that's, let's get a real good shot of the top of that, that eddy up there. That's the location. You go get another. Same lure as last time. So that part of the pattern is, is the same. And this 19 and a half incher was up there at the head of this pool in the real fast current, we're going to... Spinner baiting in that much current requires a lot of lead to get it down to the ambush points. Here's my rod selection for three quarter to one ounce spinner baits. The rod I like to use to throw these spinner baits that are between three quarters and one ounce. Um, it's one I made with a St. Croix blank. It's a set SC4 graphite, the same as the, the Legend Tournament series. Um, it's still very sensitive, but it's a little bit of a softer rod. It's a medium heavy power, so I can really winch them and, and yank them up out of these, these ledge trenches, but it's a moderate, fast action. And why that's important is with a, with a head, a lead head that heavy, uh, it's good to have a little bit of a softer rod, whereas with a faster rod and that medium heavy power, I think I'd lose a lot more fish with, with their swinging that big lead hammer around. It would really rip out of their, you know, out of their jaw a lot more if, if the rod didn't give a little bit. I'm looking at the last couple inches of line here and it's, it's pretty chewed up from flinging it up in these, these branches. All of this was dry about two, two and a half days ago, and uh, I'm throwing it up into the wood and really banging around a lot, so the line is, is suspect because it's all curled up from wrapping around stuff and yanking it on out, so 
retie frequently. Sometime in October, they frequent fast water less and less. At first, they will still take the fast presentation in slow water behind big rocks. But on days following a cold front or after a cold rain, a much slower bottom bashing presentation entices these lethargic cold bass into biting. Juan explains. Oh man, a slow roll in that spinner bait right across the tail under that island. Really slow, just I was actually jigging it off the bottom. Let me get longer arms. Oh, look at that. Whoo! Look at that fish. This is a nice 20.5 inch small mouth I caught off of a tail end of an island. We've got raise, rising water here. Uh, the bass are feeding on the bottom, they're lethargic. I came off the tail end of the island, it's creating a nice little eddy. Um, he was in the, really the slack water area of the eddy. And all I did was let the spinner bait hit the bottom, uh, lift it, let it drop to the bottom, lift it, just kind of yo-yoing the spinner bait very slowly, almost like a jig. And when I lifted it one of the times, he popped it. Uh, he was on there, he took the whole thing, and there he is, nice fish, nice fight, awesome. Gotta love this fall, love the fall. <laughs> Smallmouth fishing, man, you gotta love it. 20.5 inches, I'm stoked, seriously. Okay, let's let him go. We'll fight another day. I want to catch him when he's like 23. Oh, Same thing on this one. Just basically working that spear bait like a jig. Working that spinner bait like a jig on the bottom. fish. Too bad. I like the markings on them this time of year. They're really nice. Man, this is a great day for spinnerbait fishing. Man, this has been awesome. And the day's not even over yet. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Gotta get wet. Hey, Juan, I noticed you got a grub there as a trailer on your spinnerbait. Tell me about that. Um, yeah, I, I really like to fish spinnerbaits with a grub. Um, I will typically fish my spinner baits with grubs 90 to 95 percent of the time. I feel like it can never hurt you, but it can help you. Um, it adds bulk to the bait. Uh, it you know gives it a little bit bigger profile. It gives the fish a bigger target to hit. Um, it also adds action. You can see here uh, this is a Al Winko creation. Uh, this one happens to be um, a pearl color. And uh, the tail adds a lot of action to the bait as well. Again, just one more thing that can attract, attract a hit from a, from a fish. And so I'll, I'll almost always fish the grub trailer, and uh, it's been really good to me. So I just keep doing it, catch his fish. He's, oh yeah, that's a beauty. Whoo, man, that thing just, I mean, he just stopped it like a freight train. I mean, he, he stopped it. Whoo, yeah, nice. Look at that fish. That's a nice one. Nice spinnerbait fish. Come here, big guy. Come here, big guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's huge. Oh, yeah. You doing the same thing Juan's doing? Slow rolling. Slow rolling. Look at that. Very nice. That's a long fish. Tell me, tell me what you're doing with him. Back at the eddy. Uh, back at that island, threw it out, and as I'm drifting past the island, I just started slow rolling. I it was banging against the ground, and uh, he's 19 on the board. Sweet, 19. Nice fish. Hold him up, buddy. That's three today. Slow rolling spinner baits. Good bit of wind today. I think the forecast called for 15 northwest winds, 15 to 22 miles per hour, with gusts up to 32. Um, 
one of the things that we're going to do is hit downstream there's a bunch of islands that'll break up that wave and we're really getting pounded it's coming right out of the northwest and pushing us down through these ledges too quick so we'll get out of the way of this wind by going right downstream right where all those islands are down there we've enjoyed a nice little reprieve from the wind earlier i, I looked downstream and said we need to get in between those islands uh, to get out of the wind and that's that's helped us the northwest wind is coming straight in here and we're in a fairly narrow you know braided island part of this the river and unfortunately that's coming to an end uh, right out here you can see we got some some white caps and we're going to be back out in the thick of it one adjustment that i've made in preparation for all that wind is with my tube I've gone from an eighth ounce to a quarter ounce. You want to use the heavier weight in order to feel the bite. If you cast out and the you know the wind is putting a big bow in your line, or it continually moves your lure when you want it just to have the, the let it sit presentation, an eighth ounce isn't going to do that. A quarter ounce will. Also, going with heavier heavier lures that are cast and retrieve lures helps. This is a three-quarter ounce spinner bait. Nice big heavy one. Um, that'll make it so, you know, it'll go where I want it to go. It won't get up in the air and then with a gust of wind veer off course. So when it's windy, go with heavier lures. Let's get back into it. already made one adjustment because of the wind we got off of the bank that was getting blasted by that real strong northwest wind uh, we've come over to this bank and you can see from the leaves on the trees they're not moving as much here uh, I'm gonna make one other adjustment and it has to do with how the, the boats trim I was real gear heavy in the back and uh, the front of the boat popped up and when you're fishing you like to be pointed I mean it's just what's comfortable for us we want to be facing where we're fishing and that was real tough I, the, the wind was constantly swinging my bow around it was really catching the front so I'm transferring as much of my the gear that I'm not using today or that it's that I don't think is going to be as important uh, to the patterns that we've already found and I'm throwing as much of it as I can up front with the hopes to get that that bow down a little bit one thing that I hope kayak manufacturers take note of is that it is important to have the, the bow of your, your kayak low. And that's because, I mean, we, we like to face where we're fishing and managing your boat, maintaining boat position when you have a lot of wind on you is, uh, is a real chore. It has not that much to do with how the boat paddles, but it has a lot to do uh, with can you keep your nose of your boat into the wind so you can hold on that spot and catch the fish. Ron is up fishing the mud line at the tail end of this this island. The mud, the turbidity there is caused from the wind that's been coming straight down the river. So we've had some white caps out here and it's really beating up on that uh, that shoreline there stirring up some muck in otherwise clear water. He's throwing that spinner bait from the muddy water out into the clear. It creates a real nice ambush lane for a big smallmouth to wait for stuff to come from muddy into clear water and they pound it. Rattle traps, spinner baits, crank baits, anything. Even dragging a tube right along that, that lane of muddy and clear water. You get this in the spring too where you've had some rain and the tributaries dumping out mud. Same situation. Great situation for them to, uh, to ambush prey. Great situation for us to catch them. Another big one. You got gotcha. you. On the uh, Lucky Craft Pointer 100 Chartreuse Shad. Hey, there he goes. Nice fish. Long pause. I don't know how long, but 
it was up in that eddy, that ledge eddy. I went to Dandy. Let me try that. Oh, he's just hooked in the eye. Like that? No. Water temperature is low. It's 44 degrees, probably at the most right now. It's early in the morning, mid-November, and the fish are um, getting used to the colder temperatures. So they're they've been wanting a very slow presentation. Um, you almost can't fish it too slow, and that's what's important for people to realize: is you need to leave that bait in the water as long as physically possible. And what will happen is the fish will come up on the bait and they'll look at it and decide whether or not they want to eat it. When you go to jerk it, generally that's when your strikes happen. Right when that bait is literally just jerked off the bottom a little bit. You also want to be close to bottom, so we're in probably four to five foot of water max. And, uh, trying to get feeding November bass on the jerk bait. They're definitely starting to feed up for winter. The same fish a couple, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. Wouldn't have been this heavy. He's 19, about 19 and eighth. He's four pound, two ounces. A little bit over four. Real heavy fish. Hit that suspending jerk bait. They're definitely feeding up on minnows. And it, it really, I let it sit still for a long time before this fish picked it up. And Having the patience to let a, a suspend, suspending jerkbait sit there for 90 seconds or more, um, you almost just have to forget you're fishing and just look around and enjoy the beautiful river and uh, they'll bring you back to it. So another nice suspending jerkbait fish. There's some fundamentals about the jerkbait I really want to cover. Um, we're on the Susquehanna River, um, and the primary forage here is crayfish. But when that water drops below the 60 degree mark and into the 50s and then into the 40s, the crayfish are less active. It's not that they don't, they shut down completely, but they're less active. And the middle population becomes more active. Uh, there's, there's just more energy in them, and, and they, they, they start to actually school up in their winter, winter schools. And the bass take complete advantage of that situation. So we're going to fish jerk baits, and, and, it's, we're, and the key is it's a suspended jerk bait. And so what we want to do is we want to mimic an injured fish. Chris, how do you keep the right amount of tension or slack in the line? That's a really good question. Um, what I'll tell people is you want to move the jerk bait with the rod and not with the reels. So what I'll do is I'll, I've got a little bit of slack in my line right now. I'm going to lift a little bit of it and then jerk two gentle jerks and I'm going to wait. You can go three, you can go one, but two is just, you know, my habit. And a little bit of slack is okay because what happens up happening is you'll actually see the strike sometimes before you feel it, especially in the colder water. You'll see your line actually tighten up. It'll actually bump almost, almost like this. See, just jerk a little bit and then you'll feel the strike. Um, this is not something you have to rip the lips of the fish off. Once they're on the on, and you, you draw pressure to it, they're on. Um, they do slip treble hooks once in a while, but these fish are hungry. They're, they do not mind holding on to these baits, even though there's you know a set or two of trebles in their mouth. They're, they're gonna hold on to it. They think, it's a, they think it's a minnow. Once you hook them, they realize it's not, but they're usually pretty well hooked by then. People don't realize how strong a smallmouth, how strong their their, uh, their jawline is. Um, they're used to grabbing live minnows. They're used to grabbing and crushing crawfish in, in one complete piece. They'll hold on to that bait. This was right underneath my boat. He'd been drifting a while. Suspending jerk bait. And I'm just letting it sit like it's bait. 
Juan, who's filming, and I were chit-chatting, and I just let the jerk bait sit there. And I go to lift it out of the water, and it's under the boat when this sucker latched onto it. Oh yeah. Perch colored suspending jerk bait. He's, I don't know, 18, 19. They are lethargic and, and you know, a longer pause. I mean, letting that jerk bait sit in there, I don't know. Was it 20 seconds? Was it 30 seconds? I mean, I was not actively yank, 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 pulling on this sucker. And that's what he hit. Got a funky growth on his tail. Let's see how long he is. Hmm. 19 and a quarter. Heavy. Heavy, too. See you guy. Yeah, suspending jerk bait is what I refer to as a a cool water search bait. You know, you can cover a lot of ground. We just came right down this this shoreline and I'd probably with all those pauses probably only casted, you know, seven or eight times in that pretty long stretch there. And uh I don't know how long he followed it out for, but it it does help you narrow down you know it, it does help you strain a lot of water and figure out where they are i'm going to go back to the spot where that one was and maybe make some observations because that's the first nice one that i've caught today so let's go up and check it out all right we came back up to that 19 and a quarter hit the jerk bait we come down this shoreline we we're out away from it casting towards it and uh there's a lot of water right up in here that's you know eight or nine feet deep enough that I can't hit it with my paddle but right in here is where he hit and I can see out there there's some there's some nervous water that shows that it's going from deep to shallow uh, and we're speeding up current and we're in that deep so it was at the end of a nine or eight to nine foot deep area coming up into the four foot range so that's a taper up fish. I mean, that's classic taper up. And that's, you know, they'll, they'll hang in that stuff in all seasons. Doing this right here, picking out a backlash, is really how I figured out about how long I need to let a suspending jerk bait just sit there. I don't know. How long does it take to pick one of these things out? <clears throat> That's what happened. I mean, I, I picked out a backlash. It came back to it. Just felt the first pressure of him come back to slack and then crunched. I mean, I'm pretty sure I moved it somewhat. But he had been sitting there just looking at it like, what are you doing? Like, all right, minnow. What's wrong with you? I'm curious. And then when the minnow said, you're curious and I'm leaving, the bass said, I don't think so. You're going in my mouth. More often than not, when a big fish mouths your jerk bait, it feels just like a leaf. Picked up the first one of the day. Actually, we moved out of the, the part of the river that was shaded by that big mountain ridge, got into the sunlight. Hopefully that'll make a difference here today. Um, first cast in the, the sunlit portion of the, the river. Uh, also first cast with this particular color. So what I might do is rig up the other rods with, see ya, with this color in different sizes and hopefully fine-tune stuff so the suspending jerk bait isn't something i've I always had confidence in it actually took me a long time to really feel comfortable using this bait for very long 
you know, when you haven't caught many good fish on a lure, even when you see others doing it, you're just not patient with it. And it's certainly the kind of bait that you need to be patient with. You know, having confidence in a, in a lure is, uh, you know, you, you just earn it by catching catching nice fish. It certainly helps to go out with people that are that are good at a certain technique, like suspending jerk baiting in, in cold water. Um, but sometimes you just have to force it. You know, sometimes you just have to go out on your own with only whatever it is. I know I've done that with swim baits on the reservoirs, um, where I went out with only swim baits. You know, I didn't bring my tube rod, I didn't bring my confidence baits, I didn't bring a, you know, something I could throw Senkos with. I only took swim baits. I can't really say I did this with suspending jerk baits, but I've done it with other baits and it's, it does, you know, it does help. Not as much as catching a nice 21 inch smallmouth helps. You get that first big one on a suspending jerk bait, you're gonna throw jerk baits. One thing I like to do when I'm letting it sit and letting the, the jerk bait just suspend and drift in current is to give it a little bit of a twitch in place. I'm not pulling it forward as much as I'm just give it a little bit of a, a pop. You just pop that line and it'll just make the as it's drifting along, it'll just do a little bit of a pickup. Because, you know, you have the braided line that doesn't have any stretch, it'll transfer fairly well. You want to be sure not to, to really move it forward. You know, you're not... You, if you do too much, if you do it on taut line, it'll actually go boom and move forward. That's not what you want. You want it to just to kind of go boom. A little bit of a hiccup right in place. Long pause, I mean, I don't know, a minute, minute and a half, just letting it sit up there. I was one hand paddling just to, to stay on the spot. Hi there. And uh, that one I felt. I mean, it didn't yank the rod out of my hand, but he really was heavy too. He thumped it, he crunched it. Which was nice. I, I had good contact with that with the lure. I had the right amount of tension, and uh, he just crunched it. So, Aha. suspending jerk baits, 44 degree water, letting it sit under the foam. I'd like to thank my sponsors. Do it molds when pride is on the line. Hook one, kayakfishinggear.com. Assassinator Baits, maker of the Clacker Spinner Bait. Confidence Baits, when nothing else works, confidencebaits.net. For more instructional video, check out the YouTube channel for kayakbassfishing.com and backwoodsanglertv.com. For more info on kayak fishing classes with one group, check out kayakfishpa.com. Graphics and DVD cover artwork by fishdeviate.com. This has been a Blue Ridge Kayak Fishing production. Thanks for watching.